is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Mark Thiessen. And I'm Danielle Fudka. Welcome to our new podcast, What the Hell is Going On? We are still so new, we have that new car smell. That's really gross, Danny. It does sound kind of gross, actually. <laughs> so recently, President Trump decided to call off a military strike on Iran. This is something we were all talking about last week. Iran downed a very expensive, very valuable U.S. military drone. The president was all set to retaliate. He said his well, – the expression he used was, was weird, right? The guns are cocked. Uh, not exactly how we, we generally describe such military action. But numerous news outlets said that he stood down from that decision at the last moment because he saw General Jack Keane on television. Exactly. So he was wrestling with the decision, and all of a sudden he was watching Fox News, and there was General Keene, who pointed out that, that he thought that Trump was right earlier in the day when he said that it was possible that the uh, that the tri- strike was a fluke rather than a deliberate provocation, and talked a little bit about the Reagan administration's accidental shootdown of a Iranian jet in the 1980s when we were having the last uh, tanker conflict like this. And, uh, and the president listened to him and uh, decided not to do it. And quite frankly, I think it was the right decision to uh, to uh, hold back on a, on, a, on a kinetic strike. Right. Well, I, I agree with you that it was the right decision. I don't think that comparison is very apt. I mean, what happened in that instance when we shot down an Iranian jetliner was that actually new military technology misidentified what yes. the aircraft was on radar. It was a mistake, but not the same kind of mistakes that happened in Iran. But here's the irony for me. So one of the reasons that you and I are such big Jack Keane fans and have worked with him for so long is through Fred Kagan, who directs AEI's critical threats project. Fred was on with us a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We talked all about Iran. And one of the things that Fred said was, absolutely no way, no how. Is there any possibility that the downing of this U.S. drone was anything other than a direct decision of the Iranian government? I can't wait to hear what Jack says about that. And that may have been a convenient suggestion that wasn't necessarily taken seriously. We may know, in fact, that it was a deliberate decision and we decided to give the, let them off the hook on that for, for a kinetic response. Uh, but we did respond in a cyber attack. And Jack's going to talk about that today. Right. And well, I really haven't seen any reporting about that. Have you? No, he's got some really interesting stuff to tell us about that that has not been in the news. We're going to talk about Iran. We're going to talk about North Korea and the president's uh, decision to uh, be the first sitting U.S. president to step across the DMZ into North Korea. So I think Jack has really locked the president in on North Korea. I want to hear more about what he says about this. But basically, what he has said on the record publicly is that Donald Trump, no way, no how, will sit down with Kim Jong-un for a third time for a summit without having some nuclear concessions in hand. I think the odds of that are really, really low. So now here is the actual man himself. We're so pleased to have Jack Keene in the studio with us today. He's a retired four-star general, former vice chief of the Army, serves as the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War, and he is a member of President Trump's unofficial kitchen cabinet. Or his fox cabinet. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, but actually, I think that's a, a really accurate description. Yep. This is going to be an amazing conversation with Jack. And one thing that I hope everybody is going to wait for, we have got the general on the hook to tell one of his amazing personal stories about an experience with the New York Yankees. You guys are going to love it. I've never heard it told before. So, Jack, welcome to the program. I'm delighted to be here. All right. So President Trump called off that kinetic strike on the Iranians, but he did launch a cyber strike on Iran that got a lot less attention. You recently visited U.S. Cyber Command. Can you tell us what you learned? Well, I can't get into the details of any of that, but it has been reported that the cyber strike was considerably more significant than people realize. And I concluded in my own judgment that it's a deterrence all of its own, much like you would think a kinetic strike would be. And for our audience to understand, we formed Cyber Command, which is attached to the National Security Agency. But Cyber Command has responsibility to conduct offensive cyber operations. So the director of the National Security Agency, in this case, four-star General Nagasone, is also commander of Cyber Command. 
And during the Obama administration, they had a lot of restriction on the use of offensive cyber. As a matter of fact, in the interagency process, any person in that process could veto an offensive strike, which in my mind is an absolute absurdity. So this administration has changed the authorities. They've made it easier to conduct offensive cyber operations. It doesn't mean that the cyber command is freelancing in any sort of way. They're not. So this is a significant improvement over where we were. Would you say that the cyber strike was equally devastating to them as what the kinetic strike would have been? I think it certainly has the potential to do that. The offensive cyber, we have the best capability in the world, and I'm convinced that it is a deterrence all of its own. So one of the things, though, Jack, about deterrence is knowledge. I mean, a country is only deterred if they know what your capabilities are, which is one of the problems with cyber. When you do something covertly, something that Jack Keane knows about but he can't talk about, yes, it's a deterrent potentially to the Iranians, but of course it's not really warning the rest of the world because they don't really know. And the the general rap on our cyber capabilities is that we're not that good. It sounds to me like you disagree. Yeah, we're the best in the world at offensive cyber. We're not that good in defense because we have critical infrastructure. Most of it is you know, in the private sector, and it's not adequately defended. But no. The only domain where the private sector has primary responsibility for defense, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the financial banking system, our utilities grid, transportation system, both air and rail, all of that's completely in the private sector. And, and it's our soft and underbelly. Somewhat, and somewhat exposed. So if we're so good, one of the real capabilities that would put us in the driver's seat vis-a-vis Iran and its violations of the Iran deal, the JCPOA, or its proper initials, they're now announcing that they're going to break out, they're going to escalate their uranium enrichment levels in violation of the terms of the JCPOA, of which they, with the Europeans, are still a part. So if we could have the capacity to hit them and derail their centrifuge cascade, that would be a cyber capability. We did it once with the Israelis, with Stuxnet, years ago. Do you think we can do it? There's no doubt in my mind about it. And I think if the Iranians continue down this path, I mean, obviously they're doing this incrementally to try to get economic relief from the Europeans you know, with the promise that they'll go back and comply with the restrictions. I think when they're at the low end of this, we're likely not going to respond. We'll just continue to warn them that this is a serious threat and they're conducting a very risky operation here. But I do think if they escalate it into double digits, I would suspect, as opposed to something kinetic, which I don't think we need to do when we've got such an extraordinary capability, it's likely that that option would be on the table for the president to make that decision. And I think we would absolutely do it. And so, I mean, talk a little bit about how our cyber capability improved since Stuxnet. I mean, it's been a decade since that program was launched, and I would assume that we're in a lot better position now if we wanted to damage them than we were back then. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only thing you I heard can... it first here on what the hell is the going on. Can... Right. Jackie, not talking about our cyber capabilities. <laughs> the, the greatest concentration of mathematic PhD is the National Security Agency. Mm -hmm. And I can remember having a conversation with Keith Alexander. I said, so you guys stay up academically with the advancement in math? And he said, "Uh, no. He said, because we're making all the advancement in math and they have to stay up with us. That's great to know. A couple sleep at night. So I want to ask you a question about the recent drone downing. So it was reported among a variety of reports, I should caveat, that after Iran downed that American military drone, that extremely valuable American military drone, the president leapt into action. He said, we got to strike the Iranians. Then he saw you on TV and that one of the things you suggested was that this may not have been from the top. This may not have been an order from the top to take the drone down. It may have been a rogue operator. And watching you, the president rethought, this is a story at least, the president rethought and decided against the strike. Okay. True, not true. I don't really know. But, I mean, here's what I know. He was in the <laughs> Oval Office, what I believe it was Trudeau from Canada, and he was being expansive as he normally is. And I remember him saying words to this effect that, you know, it's possible this was a mistake. And I clued in on that. And I did call somebody who would likely be in the know, and they confided to me that, the national leadership 
in Iran did not authorize the strike. A tactical commander took it upon his, his own to do it, and that the national leadership— So that's actually true. Yeah, was mm-hmm. upset about it. So I, I think the president obviously had that information. On television, I also mentioned that we had made a mistake ourselves in the late 1980s when we were going back and forth with the Iranians who were stopping the shipping lanes then. And Reagan had taken out a couple of oil platforms. He took out uh, naval staging bases, you know, for their fast boats. But a ship by the name of the USS Vincenza, thinking they saw an Iranian fighter coming at them, actually an F-14 Tomcat, because we had sold those aircraft to the Iranians during the reign of the Shah. They were absolutely convinced it was an F-14 Tomcat, and they, the officers gave them the authorization to fire, and it was a commercial airliner with 290 people on board. And that was a horrific mistake we made, and we acknowledged the mistake immediately. The Iranians never responded. They did take the money, though. We gave them reparations right. yeah. for that. So I did say that on television, you know, that mistakes do happen with the best of intentions. I take the president at face value, and I don't have any other knowledge. He said to all of Americans, I made a decision based on what he thought was an unacceptable comparison, 150 dead and and an American drone that was unarmed. I accept that. If there was something else going on, he hasn't shared that with us, and I don't have any other information about it. So when we we had Fred Kagan on a few weeks ago. Talking about Iran. Talking about Iran. And he said, in his view, there is no way, no how, any chance that that drone was shot down without the knowledge of the Ayatollah. And they've shot down a drone before. And they've done it before, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you disagree with that assessment. Our intelligence says that Fred Kagan is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Kagan can never be wrong. You are what? as close to Fred as uh, we are, I know. So. No, but I mean, This is a family discussion, right? No, no but, but that's right. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, command and control inside these, like, sure, this could happen, but the notion that some random guy could have taken Iran into war seems frightening. <laughs> Love that. Facto. Yep. But that's not the only reason why I think the president was right to hold back and not attack. I mean, one of the reasons is the Iranians are doing these kinds of things is because they want to get the sanctions lifted because the sanctions are crippling them. And so they want to get us into a sort of a low-level skirmish to scare the Europeans into breaking with us on the sanctions. So, I mean, can you walk us through a little bit about what the strategy is with Iran and why the president's decision was right to hold back beyond the fact it wasn't intentional? Well, the Iranians opened their playbook of something they were doing in in the late 1980s and interfering in the shipping lane and creating a crisis. And I think they fundamentally believe by creating that kind of crisis that the international community, and particularly the Europeans, and and maybe uh, Japan and China also, because they have significant interest in oil coming through the Middle East, would put pressure on the United States to back off on the sanctions. But this backfired on the Iranians. And the simple reason is it's it's indisputable. We have the intelligence that not only did they sabotage one tanker, they sabotaged all six. And we have that intelligence. So as a result of that, they got caught doing something. They didn't want to get caught. They thought they could get away with this thing. And also, I do believe that when the president demonstrated restraint that put him on a moral high ground, at least, to a certain degree, that gives him some leverage dealing with our allies. And that also was not in the Iranian playbook, in my mind. And I think that's why they turned to another chapter. And they've gone to, walked away, at least temporarily, from military operations to create a crisis and pressure on the United States to uranium enrichment. Mm -hmm. With the same purpose in mind, they want economic relief, and this time they want to get it from the Europeans. It's encouraging that these feckless Europeans, who have frustrated all of us, I think, at least at the moment, are pushing back on the Iranians. And I hope they maintain that course. The Iranians will continue the pressure, I believe, here with escalation. And they may go back to military operations as well. I think the Iranians are the most determined foe that we are dealing with. And we've dealt with them for the 39 years. And to be frank about it, they've been the most successful. Lebanon, strategic anchor in Syria now. They run the war in Syria, as you know. Iraq. They toppled a friendly regime in in Yemen. They have more political influence in Iraq than we have. At the end of the day, they'll probably have their way with Iraq, given the cards that we're playing currently. And their sponsorship of terrorism, their influence in Latin America and South America. The Iranians have been playing a winning hand. And this is the first administration, I believe, that's ever been on the strategic offensive in dealing with these guys. 
So what what do you think? But Mark asked you a good question. This is where we, we went at this with Fred, too. I still can't figure out. I get what their tactics are, but I can't figure out what their end game is. I know the president wants to get to a new Iran deal, but this isn't necessary. I mean, do you think they're going to come to the table? What you, tell us what you think about this. I don't think they're even close to coming to the table. Right. They would not come to the table until they're out of options. And and listen, they've had their way with us. I mean, it's this decision-making paralysis we've had uh, by the successful use of proxies as asymmetric warfare they've been dealing with us and the lack of response that we've had. I, I think they look through a prism and they don't see the muscular desert storm or 2003 invasion by the United States, a muscular demonstration of military prowess. I think they see leadership in the United States that doesn't have the political and moral will to deal with the Iranians. I think they, they look at us as weak. Mm-hmm. And I think most of the evidence is on their side. And as, you know, as the Supreme Leader just said two weeks ago, he said, you know, we've already gotten rid of one president and we may get rid of another one if we have to. And that was Jimmy Carter, of course, using the hostages and so weakened him politically. It was more complicated than that, but that was certainly central to the problem he had. And I think they also look at our president, despite all the rhetoric, as somebody they can deal with. And I think they believe at the end of the day, President Trump probably would not pull the trigger. Though he's had the best of both worlds, because if the cyber attack was as devastating as you've suggested it was, and it's below the radar, so nobody really is aware of it in the way you would be if there were oil rigs blown up or something like that then he's delivered a a pretty devastating response to the Iranians without the costs of a kinetic response, right? The cyber attack was proportionate, as would the kinetic attack would be. But all I'm suggesting is it has a a deterrence all of its own Mm -hmm. within the proportionality of, of that attack. I'm convinced that for the time being, the Supreme Leader has no interest in going to the table with us. First of all, he personally, as we know through intelligence, when Rani brought him the, the JCPOA deal, he thought it was stupid and that the Iranians made a lousy deal. And the reason for that is... That's one area of agreement we you have. have to wait, <laughs> you, should, you have to wait 15 years. And he said, you're never going to be able to trust the Americans, you know? And guess what? The Americans broke the deal. Yeah. He was right. Yeah. He was. So why is he going to come to the table until he's completely out of options? And I think complicating this situation is you got the likes of John Kerry and European leaders telling him to wait out the Trump administration, Mm -hmm. that there's going to be this possibility of having a Democratic president who would likely want to go back into the deal. The problem with that scenario is November 2020 is a long way off, and there's no certainty. Anybody looking at American politics and what took place two and a half, three years ago knows that it's not predictable. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it is kind of somewhat outrageous to think that we actually have a former Secretary of State who's completely meddling in U.S. foreign policy that we're in the middle of executing. This is John Kerry. This is John Kerry. And I mean, any superficial reading of the Logan Act would indicate that he's in violation of the law in in terms of what he's doing. But I think the Iranians are a a long way off from coming to the table because what's the gain for them until they play out all of their options? But even if they don't come back to the table, the maximum pressure campaign is worthwhile simply because it's starving them of the resources to cause mischief in the region. I mean, when they took all the cash from the the Iran nuclear deal from under Obama and Trump came in, they were on the march across the region. And now you hear the leader of Hezbollah, you know, clinking the uh, cup and demand, asking for public contributions because they're getting cut off. You have fighters in Syria who are saying the Iranians have told us there's no more money. You have the Iranian Revolutionary Guards that had its funding cut. The Iranian military has had its funding cut. So even if we never get to a negotiating table with them, who cares? They're not doing what they were doing before. I mean, we're succeeding in starving Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. That Yeah, but that's not success. a sustainable strategy. We're talking to Jack, so I'm going to yell at you okay. afterwards about that. But, <laughs> but, I mean, you see that, too. The problem with sanctions is that sanctions erode. That's what we saw with Iraq. That's, it is very hard to keep that up. Yeah, enforcement is really the issue. And, and we've seen that right now with North Korea. We're having challenges with enforcement of those sanctions. The Chinese have been in violation for some time now, ever since Singapore. The Russians have never been in compliance with the UN resolution. But 
all this said, I mean, time is on the side of the administration here. That's, that's why I think, regardless of what the president knew or did not know about the drone strike, he absolutely made the right call in not responding kinetically. And and as we're going through this incremental increase in uh, in uranium enrichment, be patient about this. Don't overreact to this. If you overreact to it, you're playing right into their hands. Let this work out a little bit. And those sanctions are crippling them. And they've gone from two and a half million barrels of oil a day to a little north of 200,000 a day. Yeah. That is staggering in terms of its impact on their economy. And, you know, food shortages, power outages, growing civil unrest, all manifestation of, of what is happening. They have never been under this kind of pressure in 39 years. I don't think they've been under this kind of pressure during the eight-year war with the Iraq, because this is threatening that regime. And we, if they push it too far on the enrichment, we have a cyber capability that can't address it if we had to. So here's an interesting question. So Barack Obama comes in after the Bush administration, and he wants he's a, he's a non-interventionist, right? And But he knows he has to deal with certain threats, and so he glommed on to the drone war. And he decided he was, we're not going to capture these guys, we're not going to invade countries, but we're going to take them out with drones. Donald Trump came into office very similarly a non-interventionist. Is cyber the capability that he has grabbed onto as a way to deal with threats without having to go to war, without having to invade? I don't know the answer to that. We'd have to see it play out. They just looked at, one, they understand the capability we have, and it's eye-watering, you know, how good it is. And two, they obviously had to ask, why don't we use this? I mean, why is this on the shelf? <laughs> Is he the first president to really use this in a, in a vigorous way? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I really don't know. And you, you look at all, what the Chinese have done, the North Koreans have done, and the Iranians have done with us, and we never responded. I mean, I, I, would always, I always said to myself, why don't we respond and impose cost on them? You know? And we never did. No. The, the, the amazing thing to me during the Obama administration was that the North Koreans and the Chinese went in, the, North, the Chinese went in, to presidential personnel records. They stole your records, my, my records, records, Mark's records, mm -hmm. most of the people we know as records. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of personal records that they now keep and integrate with facial recognition and are using sure. right, as, a, as, a, as a, a file to keep on Americans to track us the same way, by the way, they track the Chinese people. And the, the reaction of the Obama administration was, when they attacked Sony Pictures, if you remember, Sony was making that film about North Korea that they didn't like, that, that the Obama administration retaliated against North Korea for. So I, I don't get the whole thing, but I, I want to follow up with you about North Korea. So President, you know, walks across, he's the first president of the United States to, to walk into North Korea. He walks across the DMZ, he goes in, they agree to have a third summit. I think you really locked the president in, in a way. You said publicly, and I hope he was listening, you said, and I'm going to paraphrase you, I can't imagine that president would go into a third summit with Kim Jong-un without having some nuclear concessions in hand beforehand. I'm not so sure. I, I want to hear from you. Well, there's no doubt that President Trump values personal diplomacy probably more so than most presidents, you know, we've been observing for years. And he, he has a tendency... I, I think he makes a mistake with it in this. Because he puts such emphasis on the relationship, he does not hold that leader accountable for the policies of that government and the actions of that government. And you can see it in how he deals with Putin, how he deals with President Xi, how he deals with North Korea. The president knows that this is a repressive regime. The guy's a thug. He's a killer. I've even used the words to him about Putin being a thug and a killer. He, he, he gets all that. But he, he believes that he's got this relationship in a little cocoon, and he wants to protect that relationship in the hope that he can make some progress in that relationship on matters of substance. I understand that. I, I don't agree with it, because I do think there is a place for us to put pressure on that regime as the moral force that the United States carries in the world today is significant. We are a moral authority, and we should stand up for that. And we have every right, just as Reagan did with Gorbachev, to call him out on those human rights violations and those other policies that are detrimental to world stability, etc. At the same time, 
go in there and have negotiations with a guy you particularly have some regard for. And I think Reagan and Gorbachev had some regard for each other. Mm-hmm. But Reagan was clear-eyed about what Gorbachev was representing and was not going to give in to that. Well, also, Kim Jong-un is not a North Korean Gorbachev. He's not a reformer who's trying to open up the system. So no, I totally he's agree. A brutal, yeah. brutal dictator. But I, just as the president, the president's got a little bit of a blind side there, and just as he has dealing with Russia over the election meddling, I mean, the blind side has got to be, after two and a half, three years yeah. of this, it's got to be that he doesn't want to deal with that because somehow that delegitimizes his being president of the United States. And the facts don't support that, but he doesn't even want to talk but, about it. But in all three of those cases, and also adding China, because you mentioned Xi as well, Every one of those cases, he has this almost courting relationship with the dictator, fawning in some ways, praising them, you know, developing their personal relationship. But in every one of those cases, the actual policy is as hard line as you've ever had. On Russia, that we've imposed sanctions, we pulled out of the INF Treaty, given uh-huh. javelin missiles to the Ukrainians. We've done so many things that they don't like. On North Korea, he hasn't recognized them. He hasn't given lifted the sanctions. In fact, he's tightened sanctions on Kim's inner circle. He's, he's seized a ship. With and, Xi, and, and he he's, says he's, that. he imposed I mean, massive tariffs on them. He seems to have a pattern of, you know, a iron fist with a velvet glove. Yeah. No, it, it's how he looks at it. And I just would do it differently. He's the president of the United States. I got it. And it, when I told him about, you know, Putin being a thug and a killer, he said, look, I get it. I understand that. And he said, you know, about Xi, he said, I understand Xi wants to replace the United States as a dominating country in the world. I got all of that. But he values this personal relationship. I mean, with Kim Jong-un, I know a guy that's seen all the letters. Mm -hmm. And this is before the last birthday letter. And the president mentioned a birthday letter to me. And he said, you know, four times in the letter, he said, happy birthday to me. And it's a very affectionate letter. It's not a particularly long letter, but very affectionate. Another guy who I know who's seen all the previous letters, I think there's six of them, he said, it's surprising how warm and affectionate these letters are from Kim Jong-un. And when you read through it, all of them, it has the tone of a father-son relationship. And he said it's really oh. quite extraordinary. Jack, <laughs> you know? I, you know? wow. So I'm just telling you, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you what's been reported to me. So do you think he's going to go into a third summit without, without anything in hand? I don't think so. I cannot imagine that. The good news, I think what he did with Kim Jong-un walking into North Korea and shaking his hand, I don't have any problem with it. Why? Because the North Koreans weren't talking to us. Our envoy tried to make it work. Pompeo tried to get it going personally himself. No progress being made there whatsoever. And I think Trump just said, let me give this a try. I'm going to get get this off center. I'm going to make this work. And he did. With the provision that working staff groups are going to be formed and they're going to start putting together some kind of pathway forward. If that doesn't result, from the United States' perspective, in some tangible progress in terms of inventory of weapons, some kind of timetable, inspections, etc., I don't see how we continue down this road. The other thing, the administration has made two major shifts since we started with North Korea. One is, if you remember, he wanted to finish this during his first term. They know that's not going to happen. And now he's using phrases, look, I've got plenty of time. We're going to be patient about that. So that's changed, and that's being realistic. The second thing is the thought that they would give up all of their weapons, nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, and then we would give them sanction relief after they did all of that. The administration has come to the realization that that's not realistic either. So that I want to ask you about. So first of all, the most dangerous job in the world has got to be the guy on the staff of the North Koreans in those talks. Apparently, the Glasgow guys aren't doing so well after, after failing well, in I Vietnam. Mean, everybody's wondering who they're going to be negotiating with. But here's the thing. So I wanted to ask you about the nexus between Iran and North Korea. So President Trump withdrew from the Iranian nuclear accord for a series of specific reasons, one of which is that it didn't actually denuclearize. It only froze. Uh, uranium enrichment, didn't cover missiles, it had front-loaded sanctions relief rather than lifting sanctions after the denuclearization took for all these reasons quoted on the record, this is why I'm pulling out of the Iran deal. And it didn't have any time anywhere inspection. Exactly. So how can he cut a deal with North Korea that doesn't meet the standards he set for an Iranian deal? That How can he cut a deal with Kim Jong-un that does the very things that Barack Obama did in his Iran deal? 
It'll be tough, but I still think trying is worth it, you know, given where we were. But is he boxed I mean, in by that deal? Even Kim Jong-un has got to be looking at the United States and wondering the very same thing you're talking about yeah. here. I mean, after all, Gaddafi gave up his weapons, and we deposed Gaddafi. Oh. That's got to be in his rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. He saw the United States made a deal with the Iranians, and the next administration comes in and breaks the deal. And that's one of the problems, I think, these authoritarian regimes who have consistency in their leaders for all the obvious <laughs> reasons, you know, because they're bona fide dictators dealing with the ups and downs of changing U.S. policy. But I think it's worthy to work this thing. You got to go into this with your eyes wide open. I think the president's got people around him that clearly understand what we're dealing with here. I talked to Pompeo from time to time, and I think he completely understands what the issues are. And I don't think there's anybody in government who would say anything other in a private way that, look, we don't know for sure where this is going. We're going to give it our best shot, but we don't know if this guy is really serious or not. I do think there's a difference with Kim Jong-un and his grandfather and father. You know, he, he spent some time in Switzerland. He understands the West a little bit. He understands things that his grandfather and father didn't. They put nuclear weapons in play to preserve the regime. But He is presiding over a completely dysfunctional economic base, a completely dysfunctional society. I do think he wants two things. I think he would like to increase the economic prosperity of his country and release some of the pressure, I think, that they all feel as a result of what they're depriving that society of. And the second thing is, and this is critical for him, is security. He needs a guarantee of security. And that's actually more important to him, I think, than the economic prosperity issue, because he's already got it with 40 nuclear weapons. Well, Jack, you said the president has a lot of good people around him. One of the one of the people I'm sleeping at night better knowing that one of the people talking to him is you. So thank you so much for being on this podcast with us. And promise me that because I have 100 questions on Syria and Iraq, the things that you and I talk about all the time. We don't have time. Will you promise to come back? Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. We had a really long chat with Jack. Let us just agree 100% on one thing. Jack Keane is a great American. I am so happy that the president of the United States is listening to him. And what I found really, really interesting was the way the president seems to be using our cyber capabilities in a way no president has before. That he is, he was got a lot of heat from some on the right, Liz Cheney and some of our good friends, uh, for not responding to the Iranian attack on the drone. But he did respond. He responded with a cyber attack, which Jack was being careful about what he said, but it's reportedly probably more devastating than what the kinetic attack would have been. So I think we have a president who is using U.S. cyber capability in a way that is very effective, and he's not getting a lot of credit for it. He's speaking loudly and carrying a strong but silent stick. <laughs> I'm a gonna cyber have to, stick. I, I'm going I'm to have to work on that one. I mean, I, I wish... All I can say is I really hope you're right. Uh, it, there's no question that presidents who get elected on a end this war campaign platform, and we can say that about both Barack Obama and Donald Trump. And George W. Bush. And George, yes. Good, good job, George. <laughs> and Bill Clinton. Uh, every president oh, yes, since the end of the Cold War. That's absolutely true. <laughs> but let me make my outstanding point here. Yeah. Uh, so Barack Obama gets elected on that platform. He's slapped in the face by reality, whether in Iraq or in Libya or in Syria or the Arab Spring or everything else, mm-hmm. right? But he doesn't want military action. So he figures out, oh, I can just knock everybody out with drones, and the American people think it's a bunch of guys on their video games, and we're just killing people over there. It won't bother anybody. And this becomes a big element of what is the Obama doctrine, you know, or or at least what what he would call the Obama doctrine. Small what thing. you're yeah, what you're what you're saying is that is that you think that this is at least a, a building block in the Trump doctrine. I or it may be the same thing. I hope you know, it right. may be his way of exercising American military power. In a, in a new and an innovative capability that allows us to respond to aggression without getting pulled into another major war. So you're right about that. The one thing that I said to Jack, though, and I, I think this is the flaw in the plan, is a deterrent actually has to be something people see. A, a nuclear weapon is a deterrent because everybody knows what a nuclear weapon can do. Cyber 
if if nobody knows and we hit the Iranians, you can say that they know it, but we're really not deterring anybody. I Maybe a little bit I, them. I, I fundamentally disagree with that. Yeah. So I remember we, at, the world, at, the, at the World at the World Forum a few years ago, we were this doing is, we, that's a big. It's a, it's a major AEI conference where we bring in all sorts of interesting people from all over the world, and we had a panel on North Korea, and one of the uh, speakers I remember suggested, well, if the North Koreans aren't behaving, this is before we got to the detente in their negotiating uh, strategy, said, well, you know, if we want to show them we're serious, we can just knock out some North Korean subs. And they, the world won't know about it, but the North Koreans will know about it. I, look, the Iranian regime knows that was a demonstration effect. They know what we did and what we're capable of doing now to them with a cyber attack. It was proportional, but they know that we can do more. So I think it does deter, and it deters without the blowback of public of a more uh, aggressive military kinetic hit because no one's running around complaining about the it. The only problem is, as Jack rightly said, is that the president has this weird compartmented idea about these creepy dictators that he loves. I mean, that story that Jack told about the letters between Kim Jong-un mm-hmm. and the president was downright gross. Yeah. It really was. And and let's be fair and say the grossness was mostly on Kim Jong-un's side. We don't know that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. haven't seen the letter. Ah, the gross. Yuck. One day but... <laughs> when we're old in our rocking chairs, maybe they'll release yeah, these classified I, I, letters I, you, and, you and I could actually yeah. write a whole series of really outstanding, hilarious, Gross slobbering letters, letters <laughs> between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. But that's... <laughs> But enough about be that. A good book. <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> okay, we're really digressing. So, yes. but but the problem is, you know, at a certain point, those mixed messages are really problematic because the one thing I'll say is, the press meme on this is right. Well, Donald Trump loves the dictators, and but his administration is hardline, and they're trying to hide it. Now, I think that's garbage, just as you and Jack do. But let's face it. I think the bad guys probably agree with the New York Times and the Washington Post that the president is just a wonderful guy and his administration is just doing all this terrible stuff. And that takes a lot away from his ability to negotiate. Well, you know, negotiate. I don't. I just don't fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> it should be the title of our podcast. It should be Mark saying, I just fundamentally disagree with that, Danny. <laughs> or Danny, you ignorant slut. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> No, we finally we, we, we finally got there. And, and for all of you who think I should be offended, please go look at your vintage Saturday Night Live. Yes, exactly. Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin. So I think that, you know, in negotiating in interrogation strategy, there's something called good cop, bad cop, right? And it's planned. And I, Trump is playing the good cop with the leaders, but he is to, I, I'm going to get worried about this when he starts making concessions on policy. Oh. I'm not worried yet. I don't care about him going into the D- across in the DMZ and saying Kim Jong Un is a great guy. I don't care about him glad handing Putin. What I would care about is if he started lifting sanctions on Russia. Right. Well, what I would care about is if he started if he ended the Korean War without the North Koreans giving us something. So so far there has been no concession on any of these things. And as far as the cyber is concerned, it's, it's a interesting and very useful development. But the problem with Barack Obama was that he just used it as a way to avoid war and avoid dealing with these things. Oh, absolutely. It, it wasn't part, a strategy. It, it has was to a be tactic. part of a strategy. And so totally. it, it's a great tool. I love the fact that the president is using the cyber tool, but it has to be part of a broader strategy that is directed at getting us to an end. Okay, folks, that's the wrap of our formal grown-up if you can call us grown up, interview with Jack Keane. But we really wanted to share with you, and Jack gave us the thumbs up, a conversation that we had right at the beginning of our podcast when he walked in. So many years ago, Jack was sitting next to me on a plane. We were flying up to LaGuardia, and I'm afraid to fly. Lots of people know that. And so he was distracting me by telling me stories. And I remembered one of them, and I asked him to tell it to us again. I've never heard him tell it publicly. And so he agreed to share. This is when he got his fourth star in the Army. And the Yankees a team he'd idolized his entire life, just in case you weren't able to tell from his accent. He has a slight New York accent. Uh, anyway, this team asked him if he wanted to to come and throw out the first ball. And so he starts telling the story, and he's laid out the conditions. And one of them is that there will be a an Army parachute team that parachutes into Yankee Stadium. Anyway, catch him from here. We missed, we lost the first couple seconds because it was right when he walked in, but you'll get the rest of it, and I think it's really worth it. I heard Yankee.
hockey fan, so she said, sir, we already know that. I said, but here's the deal. I'll only do it if you do this for me. The Golden Knights are going to parachute into the stadium. My guys, my Army Chorus is going to sing the national anthem. We're going to do the color guard, and I want 500 seats for soldiers. You got a deal? She said, we got a deal. She said, it's sold out but we're going to get the 500 seats somehow, some way. So it was a Wednesday afternoon, and as opposed to doing what they do at other stadiums, you know, where they put you out there ahead of time, the entire Yankee team was on the field, and then they brought me out. So the only position that was missing was the pitcher, and they had this big sign up there with me, and they, it has all the stuff about their, you know, medals and stuff and the rest of it. But I had a huge emotional moment because Bob Shepard was the stadium announcer, and my dad took me to the stadium when I was eight years old, and he was the stadium announcer then, and he lived into his 90s. And I used to do imitations of him, because in the 1950s, in that original stadium that they had, 1950s and 60s, the PA systems weren't that good, so it would reverberate. So I would stand on a chair in the house, and I would say, ladies and gentlemen, direct your attention to the Yankee dugout. Now, approaching the mound, and so I, I would do this in front of my family. I couldn't sing, but I, this is my only performance. And, of course, they gave me all sorts of encouragement, even though I probably looked like a jerk. So I know Shepard is going to be the announcer, all right? So she said, sir, when uh, Mr. Shepard starts talking about you, just move towards the mound. And they don't let you stand in front of the mound. You stand on the mound. On, mm -hmm. now. So he starts saying, talking about me. I'm getting emotional now. And he says, please welcome back to Yankee Stadium a guy that grew up here in a city housing project and spent all of his life doing this, this, and this. So by the time I get to the mound, I am crying. And I'm on a big screen. So I said to myself, oh, my God, I got to get my shit together here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so before I left the Pentagon that morning, I had a meeting with my three stars, and my public affairs guy is a two-star, and he said to me, hey, boss, he hung back. He said, you know, this is a pretty exciting day for you, you know, given your preoccupation with the Yankees. He said, yeah. He said, you know, you're going to be nervous. And I said, yeah, I know. I'm already nervous. He said, listen, whatever you do, don't dribble that ball in front of the catcher. <laughs> a big guy like you, four-star general, don't dribble that ball. So I took my hat off. I said, I got I to get my emotions back. I took my hat off and I threw it right on the mound. I took the ball and threw it, and it went th about three feet over the catcher's head. <laughs> All the way to the backstop. Oh, well, that's and better than I, dribbling it. I have to picture it. myself, my arms up in the air, and there's this collective moan in the stadium. Oh. All at the same time. So Posada, who's an all-star catcher, comes back to me with the ball, and he said, General, strong arm. I said, Jose, you're the guy that made the error here. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> you screwed this thing up. <laughs> So what happened is the Yankees that were in the dugout all came out of the dugout to come out and meet me on the field because they knew I felt bad. Yeah. Oh. And then the whole stadium started roaring. Oh, that's awesome. That is such a great awesome story. story. And with that, we're going to call it a day. Thanks for listening, folks. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.